taking me a little bit this morning to get started. It's kind of rough when you've been sick all week. But then when you get to the house of the Lord and you revived. The song says, sings like never before. It's a different feeling when you get into the house of the Lord. Continuing in our series is all about Jesus. Trying to get that song out of my head. How good the Father is. And to be loved by him. Hallelujah. Let us begin our journey this day. In Luke chapter 24. In verse 13 it says... That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. How can you be kept from recognizing Jesus? He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short and sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all these things that have happened there the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But one leading, but our leading priests and our religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to sea, and sure enough, his body was gone just as the woman had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures? Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them. And they sat down to eat. He took the bread and blessed it, then broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were open and they recognized him. And at that moment, He disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Last verse. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking bread. Amen. Bless the word of God. Word of God speak today. One of the most exciting things we enjoy once a year is what? An eye exam. Y'all don't look too excited about that. 
You know, you are told to sit in this chair, to lean back, why they put these drops in your eyes and dilute your pupils. And then you, then you have to sit up straight, put your chin in the machine, in the little, I don't know what it's called, but anyway. And so you got to stare at this red dot that's on the, the little screen. And then the optometrist weighs the, the retinoscopes and make you blink rapidly. Then they break out the chart and ask you to read the smallest line that you can see. And you look at it and you like, Z, B, D, A, N. Unless you have 20 or less vision, you probably only get to line three. Nevertheless, after you finish and the technician records the results, they reach over and then they switch the lens, and the letters become clearer. You ever notice that? As we explore the story of these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, I want you to ask, I want us to ask ourselves, what lens are we looking through? The first one is our perception, which we get from seeing what's going on around us, what's going on in the world. Or are we looking through the second lens, which is the scripture, the truth, the word of God? So what happened on the road to Emmaus? In this final chapter of the Gospel of Luke, there appears a beautiful, this standalone story that is only written in Luke. This story was written nowhere else but in Luke. And I call it a standalone story because it's only about these two disciples and Jesus. These two men distraught over the death of Jesus who find themselves in deep conversation with the teacher himself and only don't they realize that it is him. In this powerful tale, one is filled with lessons about discernment, hope, truth, and the Old Testament prophecies. So later that same, the same day of the resurrection, as Luke points out, the two men are walking together on this road to the village called Emmaus. The men are discussing all the events of the past days, and we see that they are troubled. Luke account tells us that their faces was downcast. It said that they were sad. They were sad that Jesus was dead and no longer with them. And so Jesus comes alongside them and listens to their conversation. But these men do not know that it is Jesus. This lack of recognition is not necessarily their fault because scripture tells us word that they were kept from recognizing him because their eyes were restrained, as verse 16 said. They were seeing through that first lens. How many of us look through that first lens? How many of us resort to others before we resort to God? When Jesus asked what they are discussing, the men explained their version of the past few days events, as well as their disappointment over their seemingly unfulfilled hopes and confusion about what the woman had seen at the tomb. He said in verse 21, we had hopes he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. How many people get a false perception of who Jesus is, of who Jesus came, I mean, why he came. They had a preconceived idea of who Jesus was, what he had come to do, and how he should do it. But when things did not turn out like they thought it, they should, they dismissed the whole thing as a mere failure, a misplaced hope and trust. This matter is very rapid on social media today 
and all around the world. Amen. Many people are looking at situations and circumstances rather than looking to the word of God. Many people are putting hopes and things that they what they want Jesus to do. And let's be honest, how do you feel when things don't turn out the way you want them to? When God doesn't do what you ask him to do? Many are walking away from the gospel today because of this very same reason. I thought God would do this. I thought God would do that. I read one, one, one quote one day. A guy said he don't believe that God exists because he, pray, he prayed earnestly that God wouldn't take away his parents, but God did. And he said, how can there be a God if he could take away my parents? Unfortunately, it's many things that we don't understand that God does. But we do know for sure that what? He is the creator. And we don't have the right to tell God what he can and can't do. But I will say this. I know his plan is way better than our plan. I know what he wants is way greater than what we want. I know this may be a bad metaphor, but would it be right if you was in love with a can of tuna but it, it said it expired January 25th, 23. Would you pray earnestly that that tuna extend past its date? Probably not. But what I'm saying is, God has a place and a time for all of us. And when he calls us home, it is his calling. Whatever date that we expire, it is his time. Why? Because he's calling us back to him. We need to be careful not to make the same mistake, to discount what God has done simply because we cannot explain it or understand it. While God often uses natural things to accomplish his will, he also does things we neither explain or nor understand. If you ever be around a Christian that know it all, you better run fast as you can. Because there's some things that cannot be explained. Is it not God who says what? My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Just because they knew about Jesus does not mean that they knew him. Just because they could see him does not mean that they could see who he was. Many people today know who Jesus is. They have heard about him. They have read about him, used his name, and many even claim to know him. They would not recognize him if they saw him. Their eyes have not been opened, and Jesus has not reached over and changed to that second lens. We professing Christians, amen, serve Christ our Lord. But do we know him? This gospel that we share, do we believe it? That is a greater difference in 
knowing and knowing about something. Jesus expresses a gentle rebuke, telling the man how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Do not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter his glory? You know, our mistakes may sometimes take us out of the will of God, but they will never place us beyond his reach. These mere perception was out of the will of God. But their reach was not out of the reach of Jesus. At that moment, he knew that he had to be present with his two disciples because their perception was being misled by what they saw. And many times the Christian rely on what we see, not what he said. Then Jesus proceeded to explain the Old Testament stories from Moses to the prophets and how they all fully and completely point to the Christ. He may have started from Genesis 3.15. He may have shared some of Deuteronomy 28, even a little bit of Ruth and Samuel. I believe definitely he shared Isaiah and Zechariah. Doesn't every book of the Bible point to him? Jesus wanted them to know that all those things look hopeless and they might have doubts. They have to look no further than scripture to understand what happened and what will happen. First, the Christ must suffer then he is glorified. So the question to you is, where do you look for your answers? Do you look in the book for your answers? Do you look to the world for your answers? Or you find your best friend for your answers. Has the word ever deceived us? Psalm 119 in verse 81, it says, but I hope in your word. Jeremiah said, the word is like fire, shut up in my bones. It's power in the word. Amen. It's life in the word. Amen. It's instructions in the word. It's direction in the word. If Satan is a deceiver, then he would love for you to what? Look anywhere else but in the word. That is one of the reasons it's so important to believe in all of the scripture as God's word. For if it is untrustworthy at any point, then it can be untrustworthy at every point. It is either all God's word or it is not his word at all. When you know the scripture, they will build your faith. And only through faith can you come to Jesus. The truth of scripture about Jesus leads to personal faith in Jesus. Amen. When you are alone. When you don't know which way to go, when you feel helpless, can you not go to Jesus? 
He said in John, those who eat of my flesh will have eternal life. How much of this are you eating? Does the Bible say faith comes by seeing and seeing the word of God? Or does it say faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God? You can look at this book all you want to, but if you don't listen to it, what good it will it do you? Many can quote scriptures, but do they live in what they read? One of the things in Hebrew in their culture is knowing is doing, and doing is knowing. You can't know something and don't do it. So whatever you know, you have to practice it. And if you don't practice it, you don't know it. I pray that you hear in my heart today. Because if you know this, you will practice this. And when you know this, it will lead you in your life. We have to know that this whole thing is all part of God's plan. Amen? Amen. So Jesus doesn't reveal himself until dinner time. He doesn't reveal himself while they're on the road, but instead he waits till they arrive to their destination till they relax, preparing and enjoying a meal. And then he breaks bread, gives it to them, and their eyes are open. He reaches over and switches that lens. We have to understand that it took a little time for their hearts to catch up to their head. But they finally did, and they knew the truth completely. If you think about it yourself, it takes you some time for your heart to catch up with your head. Amen? Because the head, your mind, runs like a machine. But is the heart is where Jesus is. And when your heart catches up with your head, then you fire it up with knowledge. And you can't wait to tell or share somebody that good news. These men, after they broke bread, and received it from Jesus, was fired up. They said in the inside, they was burning. At times, does you get into your worship, get into your study, and let Jesus open the scriptures to your heart and you have a different feeling about yourself, about life, about eternity. This journey with these two disciples Can you ever picture you being one of those disciples? 
and he come alongside you and reveal and show you where your perception is, where your heart is, and where your destiny is. And just like these two men who had it wrong, and he gently comes and corrects them, he does all of us the same. So on our journey throughout this life, I pray that he will come alongside and make sure that you are looking through that second lens. Amen. So after they fired up, they done had this journey they go back and tell the other 11 how Jesus has risen. They're excited. Then later on, they get a visit from Jesus. And I'm thinking about the question Pastor asked last week. Why weepest thou? In John chapter 20. At verse 19, Jesus gives three benedictions of peace be to you. The first one, he says, then the same day of the evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples are assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. In this first, the ground of our relationship, peace, is fully and forever established. The wounds tell us that the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. The future may be dark. We may have many trials and temptations. We may stumble, but nothing can affect the value of the cross. It is important that the Christian should fully grasp the blessedness of this truth. Wherever we go, bright and joyful or depressed, this benediction and this ground are ours. His second benediction. Verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. In this second benediction, the power of our walk is given. What dignity this is. To represent God's son. To show in our life and by our words how he would speak and walk. This is the standard of Christian holiness. None dare make it lower. He that saith he abideth in me ought himself also to walk even as, I, as he walked. Amen. We ought to walk even as he walked. Have we received the Holy Spirit? Have you allowed Jesus to breathe on you? The third benediction. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your fingers here and look at my hands. And reach your hands here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but be leaving. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. 
Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Hallelujah. That should be all of us. Lastly, in this interview with Thomas, the most touching illustration of the care of the great shepherd for his wandering sheep. Thomas had been away from the place of blessings and so had become by believing, unbelief. The Lord meets him in his unbelief and shames him by giving him the very proof he demanded. He goes back to the beginning with him. He needed to be established in truth, taught by the pierced hands inside. Thomas got a sight of Jesus' wound and cried, my Lord and my God. When we have gone astray, what is it that restores us? Not a high truth, but the simple great foundation truth of the atonement. Have we grown worldly, cold, and gotten away from close communion with the Lord? He recalls us by the same precious truth that first won us to himself. And that was peace be to you. Amen. Amen. A man's daughter had asked the local minister to come and pray with her father. When the minister arrived, he found a man lying in the bed with his head propped up on two pillows. An empty chair sat beside his bed. The minister assumes that the old fellow had been informed of his visit. I guess you were expecting me, he said. He said, no, who are you, said the father. The minister told him his name and then remarked, I saw the empty chair and I figured, I, I figured you knew I was going to show up. Oh, yeah, the chair, said the bed bedridden man. Would you mind closing the door? Puzzled, the minister shut the door. I have never told anyone this, not even my daughter, said the man. But all my life, I have never known how to pray. At church, I used to hear the pastor talk about prayer. But when it right, but when it right, but it went right over my head. I abandoned any attempt at prayer, the old man continued. Until one day, four years later, my best friend said to me, Johnny, prayer is just a simple matter of having a conversation with Jesus. Here is what I suggest. Sit, a, sit down a chair and place an empty chair in front of you and in faith, see Jesus on the chair. It's not spooky because he promised I will be with you always then just speak to him in the same way you're doing with me right now. So I tried it, and I've liked it so much that, it, so that I do it a couple of hours every day. I'm careful, though. If my daughter saw me talking to an empty chair, she'd either have a nervous breakdown or send me off to the funny phone. The minister was deeply moved by the story and encouraged the old man to continue on the journey. Then he prayed with him, anointing him with oil, and returned to the church. Two nights later, the daughter called to tell the minister that her dad had died that afternoon. Did he die in peace, the minister asked. She said, yes, when I left the house about 2 o'clock. He called me over to his bedside and told me he loved me and kissed me on the neck, on the cheek. When I got back from the store an hour later, I found him dead. But there was something strange about his death. Apparently, just before Daddy died, he leaned over and rested on his on, rested his head on the chair beside the bed. What do you make of that? The minister wiped a tear from his eyes and said, "I wish we all could go like that in the arms of Jesus. Let us stand." Do you know about Jesus this morning? Or do you really know Jesus? 
Have your eyes been open to what he is, who he is? Do you know that he walks with you and talks with you? Can you testify to his presence in your life? Do you have fellowship with him? And has your experience with him been so real, so moving, so life-changing that it has caused you to tell others about him? And so our leaving question is, what would you do with Jesus today and the rest of your life? Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that you have pointed your word for us, God. And Lord, I just pray that if there's anyone under the sound of my voice, God, that that need you to come alongside with them, Lord, and change that first lens to that second lens that they may see the truth, that they may walk in the truth and stand on the truth, that you will lead and guide and direct them as only you know how. And so I pray right now that we would all surrender and submit our will unto you that we would offer you our very life, that you may breathe the Holy Spirit on us, O oh God, that we may be transformed into the children of God, and that the rest of our lives would be lived out in the will of God. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word which is our life. And I pray that whatever we face, we will always look to the scriptures first. We would always call on the name of Jesus first. He is the author and finisher of your faith. And he is the alpha and the omega. There is nothing else needed to be said. It is he who is our everything. For that, God, we praise you. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Let us recite Psalms 1914. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be accepted in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Happy Sabbath. God bless you.